Hello, Scrappers. Juro here again, and I would like to welcome everyone to episode three of Machine Learning. We've got another fun one for you here today, folks. We are going to start again, like we always do, with a little bit of a recap. This time of episodes 11 through 15 to uh, finally get us caught back up so that after this, we will then be releasing this show on a monthly basis covering the episodes that occurred during the previous month. Also, word of warning, we are going to, in this episode, talk a little bit about other TTRPGs and other play styles. And nope, nope, please don't change the channel. Welcome back to the Galarian Wildlife Network. As always, I'm your host, Ava Stadenbeer. On today's episode, we'll be exploring the subterranean ecosystems of the northern nation of Numeria. While this wild, savage land may be more well known for its automatons and otherworldly visitors, it's also home to a myriad of flora and fauna not found anywhere else in Galarian. Take, for example, the humble fire beetle, Ignis coleoptera. Ranging from a few inches after hatching to roughly the size of a domestic cat when full-grown, the fire beetle is a tenacious, hardy scavenger. While solitary beetles pose little threat, larger clusters and colonies can be a serious danger to unwary spelunkers and adventurers, with their powerful mandibles able to cause painful bites that can easily prove fatal in large numbers. Their name comes from their unique predicament among subterranean fauna. The fire beetle is unable to see in the dark, and so compensates by emitting a yellow-green phosphorescence from specialized glands located on each of its six legs and on the backside of its hard, dull yellow carapace. These luminescent glands are so efficient that they are even able to continue generating light after the beetle itself has died sometimes for as long as six days. In many parts of Numeria, these beetles are captured and caged to be used as light sources for miners, and their meat is considered a delicacy among some of the local Kellid bands. Yeah, and then just jam it in there, it's fine. Yeah, square peg, round hole, who cares? Welcome to machine learning, etc. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to Machine Learning, the only supplementary podcast where we immediately start off by talking about jamming things into holes. <laughs> I am your host for this week, Jero, and I am the voice of that random dude who I can't do the accent for that's shown up in a couple of Vargas's flashbacks. With me is Izzy, the voice of Kingsley the Scorpion. Hello, I'm Kingsley. And Izzy. And Jeff, the voice of that weird sack monster from episode 7. And he doesn't say anything, but I'm sure his <laughs> voice is probably like, Oh, hello, you want a button or something? <laughs> that is exactly what I was picturing. That's wild. The uh, Cockney Sack Monster. Also, I find it difficult to believe we're the only supplementary podcast that starts off with talking about jamming things in holes. That can't possibly be true. <laughs> there are a lot of podcasts out there. Although I don't know how many of them are supplementary, so. And how many of them are pod about the machine from pod against the machine the only podcast with a supplementary podcast with a 25 word title probably not many Ooh, i know well, this I mean... one we're the only ones <laughs> it's just by one. definition yeah. it's yeah. just the one yeah, eventually you'll well narrow done, it down enough that it only is us which is all we've wanted to do with this show is just really find the people who will stick with us by forcing them <laughs> to listen to a supplementary podcast on a sunday so we are going to start off with a bit of a recap of what happened in episodes 11 through 15. This will be our last kind of like five full episodes jammed together recap. 
episodes going forward will basically just have a recap of the three or four episodes of the previous month. But yes, we had some interesting stuff. So we had TPK, subscribe on GooTube, Welcome to the Fungal, Delirium Dumpies, and Sloppy Nods and Piggyback Rides. And I love these dumb names. It really came into our own there, <laughs> round 11. Mm. So the first big thing we had was going into this uh, really interesting technological building, immediately getting zapped into a horrible trap, which technically happened at the end of 10, and then opening a conference room to meet our uh, interesting buddy Hetua, and almost experiencing a TPK basically in the first episode of the double digits uh so what did you two think about that interesting little fight well i think we did experience a full tpk just you know jeff's tpk and not traditional tpk well actually no i guess jeff what's your definition of totally peaceful um well i have in my notes that he was wielding two diplomacy knives so i was really (laughs) expecting a much friendlier encounter so, so when I think of totally peaceful, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I know I don't really think of Hatuath. Fair. Okay. Yeah. Would you say partially peaceful? Uh, we could go with briefly peaceful. Briefly peaceful. I think before before the threat on our lives and attack came, it was fairly talkative. Yeah. He uh, had a nice little conversation with Vargas and... Then he immediately threw a spear into Asher's shoulder, I believe, and tried to kill us all. Yeah. One of sure these did. days I'm gonna I'm gonna use that javelin. Just you wait. <laughs> Do you still actually have that on your character sheet? That was Javelin. Uh, I should hope that Kira is carrying it because I hate to be encumbered. <laughs> Yeah, we picked up a lot of stuff from that particular episode. I'm almost sure I'm just right on the edge when Kermit, but that's, well, that's another episode that's, time. That's true. That's yeah. true. I loved Hetuat's voice, though. Uh, I wish Sam was here to do it for us. He has done some really good voices. It was almost like a raspy golem sort of thing. It was mm. great. It sounded like what you would expect a zombie to sound like, like... If that makes any sense, like something that's like dead and doesn't breathe anymore, you kind of would expect it to sound like that. It's got that old dead and doesn't breathe anymore voice. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Classic. Yeah. Everybody knows that voice. We all have that one friend, right? (laughs) This is just one in. (laughs) Right. No, I wasn't. If you you don't know that friend, you are the dead and not breathing friend. Sorry. a rough one we'll have a support group after (laughs) this was one of many instances in which asher saved everyone Mm -hmm. just right in there it's it's the asher brand by this point oh boy it was definitely a nerve-wracking one but uh yeah i was definitely glad that that we all managed to survive that encounter especially because the the stupidity of me as a player just being dumb of like oh they're flavor around things what are the flavor and then translating that into Asher having to actually roll a perception check to lick whatever, like, rock that was. Yeah. But you kind of nailed it, right? You, you licked the rock. I did. Yeah. But I, I, I feel like the story has now informed Asher and he's going <laughs> to eventually get, him, get some disease by licking something. Yeah. Oh, well, it happens to the best of us. Yeah, licking a random uh, glowing mound in an uh, alien spaceship. <laughs> Sometimes that's the best way to get a sense. That was another thing in this group of episodes that we confirmed. And I, as a player, was actually kind of dumb in this. Because there was a point where everybody else is like, well, yeah, it's a spaceship. And I'm like, oh, it's a spaceship. (laughs) Like, I honestly thought, like, a spaceship had crashed and somebody built this place out of the wreckage. Because I'm apparently not very smart. But this was the group of episodes in which... We turned on the little hologram and confirmed that it is a buried spaceship, which is exciting, you know, like, and the other stuff that we found with that as well, the Tisatha plant friend who is just amazing, (laughs) and a few other things that we found like that, it's like these aliens have been going around collecting things and sticking them on these ships with these like zoo fake habitats in them. It's an interesting uh, story concept. 
Yeah, 12 was a fun one to edit for me because there were, I don't know, I didn't count, I should have counted the number of trap checks that, that Zach rolled for Brixby. I definitely made a joke and don't do this at home, listeners, but if there was a drinking game for every time Zach said high tech or mechanical traps in episode 12, <laughs> even like, like it would be bad. We'd, we'd have lawsuits on our hands. But we also had some great musical goofs, and mm-hmm. I think everyone's favorite sponsorship plea in a podcast, uh, except for <laughs> Izzy, known despiser of Gogurt, but the soft everyone. But the GooTube, everyone is everyone asterisk. <laughs> the GooTube was just a sheer delight, and has mm-hmm. has continued to be. Look forward to future episodes, listeners, because... It has endured. It has endured, but I also think we haven't overdone it yet. I think I think we're doing a good job at uh, perpetuating the enjoyment of GooTubes. Yeah. <laughs> Peppering it in. Yeah, rather than uh, beating it into the ground, we wait until you've forgotten about it, and then we uh, surprise you again <laughs> with it. Bring it back. We've got 120 of those, so we'll be making fun of them for a while. And on top of the goo tubes, we also found a lot of other really interesting stuff. We found the flashlight that I thought was going to be a lightsaber when Sam started describing it. And that's what Brixby yeah. named it in, in character. It's, yeah. It's canon. Yeah, true. That's canon. The radiation detector, which I'm sure is not hinting at anything. The swarm bane clasp, which I'm also sure is not hinting at anything. Just uh, random things that we found will have no future importance. Yeah, those are the sorts of items that when you come across, you think, oh no, I'm going to need this. And that means one of us might survive. <laughs> I thought it was just a nice necklace. As uh, Asher, Brixby, and Vargas are eaten by some sort of horrible aero- alien cockroaches, at least we'll be safe in the knowledge that Kira is completely safe. Just hanging out with Zombie cockroaches? Alien cockroaches? Who's to say at this point? Well, going by what we've seen so far, zombie alien cockroaches. Yeah, well, well they'll not all depend on what the the future party members you find as our replacements, if they have the right knowledge skills to know. Oh, God. Well, they'll have to, because I don't. You got that local. I don't think I've ever <laughs> successful, like done a successful local check, though, is the thing. Because I still have a minus one. So, like there's there's the wasn't your oh no it wasn't it, it was, was not uh, asher's i was gonna say wasn't your local check the one that let us know the purple haired lady was a merchant in town but no that was asher's local check the guy who was in town for two days right that's we're constantly like kira you've lived here your whole life what do you know about this and she's like nothing why so uh you're welcome everyone but hey one day that familiar fly score is going to come in handy and we're going to look back on these episodes and know that I was right adjacent is the other thing. oh and I mentioned him earlier uh, another thing speaking of aliens we met a plant friend who was uh, really lovely I'm sure we'll eventually go back and recruit him into the party yeah Mm-mm. I mean just a hungry plant y'all nope. yeah. I've been thinking about that failed will save for like two months now what does it mean? Does anyone even remember the failed will save? Because I remember the failed will, will save. Will save? I do remember the failed will save. I'm assuming since we ran into this guy pretty early on, it's not anything that's going to last like several days. <laughs> like we, we go back down there and you're able, he's able to control you or anything, but who knows? I super doubt. You can say. Super that's true. doubt several Kira is now growing one of those in her brain or something. That would be... Such a bummer, but fun. Yeah. A fun bummer. Bummer first. It's going to take over your body and make you go buy fertilizer. But not like the fun kind, the chemical kind, that when you walk through the grass and then go to the airport, they have to swab the thing. You know, that's an experience we've all shared, Uh, right? So that was fun. (laughs) Back to the editing 12 was that we we met Plant Friend at the end of 12. And it was one of those things that if any of our listeners have played a game on on a virtual tabletop, whether that's Roll20, Fantasy Grounds, Foundry, whatever, is that occasionally you might see a token on the map as soon as you enter a room that either you might not have seen yet or 
maybe it was on the wrong layer and we all saw we're like what is that <laughs> oh no <laughs> and it was a good time for Brixby to just kind of saunter up to a computer and I believe if I remember correctly that Sam described everything else in the room yeah. first while we were all yep. looking at mm-hmm. that token <laughs> mm-hmm. and also <laughs> like just <laughs> lovingly detailed describing the computer, the lights. <laughs> yeah. The height, depth, and width of all the desks. Like, Sam, what about the thing? <laughs> but there is a thing there. After meeting Plant Friend, we looked around some more, and we happened to open a door into a medical lab. And I believe if I switch to another tab on my computer right now, we are still actively fighting the uh, <laughs> flying uh, specimen collector drone. Yeah. Those were the days. Lost a lot of years there. A lot of good memories. That 18 century long session. It's a generational game now as our children will continue this fight. It's honestly what I was hoping for when I started the podcast. I was like, what can I pass on to my children one day? How about this single combat <laughs> session with these internet strangers and one robot? Yeah, which is a good thing that we went after the other robot first. There would have been two robots. Well, could you imagine that other one, when it hit me, it dealt two points of strength damage? Which, even if I had full strength, my max damage I could do was 10, so I couldn't hurt it anyway. If it had done that to Kira, we would have no one in our party who could do damage to that. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, fatigue was bad enough, so attacking on strength damage. Yeah, I think about that a lot. Going back and listening to the episode, I was like, it is real, real lucky that, I mean, that was a crazy long episode anyway. But yeah, if that had worked out any differently, it would not have worked out. We threw three Sky Medals at Kira that fight. <laughs> like, please, please roll high. Not to mention uh, <laughs> oh God, that was Asher rough. with the wand just burning through charges every round to keep Kira up. Yeah, this, I don't think I have done enough in my life to thank you, Jeff, <laughs> for not letting me die for the course of two hours. Hey, really happy to help. It. You know, I've actually been on the receiving end of that in another game that I played on World 20 a couple years ago, and I was the uh, the party tank with my gnome paladin slash oracle. And there was definitely a fight there where the healer in the party just kept wanding him to stay alive. <laughs> so, you know, I feel like in some small way I've returned the favor. I mean, because I don't know, and this is, again, fairly new to the game, but I don't know that there's a whole lot else we could have done. Like you just said, there is only... Even when I was hitting, half the time it wasn't mm-hmm. doing enough damage. Like, that's... Oh, and I thought, scary. like, and I think there were even a couple more instances of it that were cut out along with all of the rest of that fight that was cut out. But all of the times that Sam kept mentioning the tube in the corner with a shadowy shape in it, I'm like, he's not going to mention this nine times unless that's how we're supposed to beat this otherwise unwinnable fight. So I'm like, okay, we got to break this open. We got to do it. And when we finally do break it open after the fight, it's a half-dead old man who can't do anything (laughs) to help us. It's like, oh, so if we had gotten this open in time, all that would have happened is the robots would have killed Connor along with us. Got you. Yeah. Which... So yeah, ultimately it came together. I wonder, though, had that happened, because, let's see, we find that out in 15 about his condition... Mm -hmm. Well, we know that there's something wrong with him. We don't know exactly yet, yet by 15. It is obvious his legs are all torn up and he is, I believe he was like babbling at first and then we were worried he was going to go unconscious. Yeah. (laughs) I just wonder if the robots had killed him and he was brought back to life. I'm guessing he would be all restored ability wise. Yeah. If there's anything like that going on, mm. like whatever his condition Yeah, is. I don't think it's something that would last past uh, death. Which, uh, funnily enough, that was something that... Yeah, <laughs> that was something up. that uh, I mentioned as something that Vargas would have absolutely done in character upon realizing that this dude was not going to be able to swim back or help us in a fight is... Well, they told us they have a scroll of resurrection. Just kill him. It'll be easier to drag him Just back that him. way and then revive him and get to town. 
<laughs> which is hilarious out of character, but also yeah. lightly terrifying. Yeah. Yeah, it's fine. Just murder him. Well, yeah, and I do see on my notes because I like to record when I roll well uh, <laughs> uh, that I that I rolled a natural twenty on my check to figure out what's wrong with Connor, and so we we knew we know at this point in fifteen that he's got severe dex and intelligence damage, mm-hmm. uh, and then yeah, Vargas just kind of passing by and like, oh, if you want me to take care of him, <laughs> and then just kind of keeps going. It's like, I love it. Chaotic neutral. It's the yeah. turn and walk there for me. Because <laughs> this was also... No, maybe it wasn't. But there was an episode before this where Vargas had said something else to cure yeah, that was, was supposed 12. to be comforting. That was like... That was a people die like and then kept walking. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was among this group of episodes. <laughs> it was... Because mm-hmm. it was right after we found the storage closet with all of the fancy technology in it and Vargas trying to be helpful is like well this is what uh, people said to me when I was a kid and experienced like people in our tribe dying so he just walks up to Kira and he puts his arm on his shoulder people die you'll get over it (laughs) like as far as he's thinking like yes that's the correct way to comfort someone after someone they know died I love the idea that he's like walking away, like congratulating. He's like, "Yes, yeah. I did it. Yeah. So good at this." Which is just fun, honestly. My young, my oldest son. We've started listening to episode one and thinking back to when Vargas referred to as like this, this orc, half orc woman. If yeah. whatever she's doing, like I'm in. I'm uh, let's fight off the Technic League. And you wouldn't even hadn't even bothered to learn people's names. Yeah, like, he didn't even bother to re- remember her name. <laughs> yeah, I think, like, after he saw this thing with Parda and, like, Kira wanting to get her body out, like, that's when he started respecting her. It's your, it's your classic. It's the stepping in at the DFB. <laughs> Solves all relationship problems. Uh, so the last kind of thing that happened with that group of episodes is after we rescued the severely damaged Connor, we trekked back out and discovered that the uh, Skulks had pieced off, and they gave us some treasure and mentioned a moldy body that uh, I believe uh, at the point that we're up to recording-wise, we still have refused to investigate. <laughs> Yeah, and Brixby pushed the button. That was a big thing, too. And yes, and turned the power back on. Push the button. Brixby finally got to push his big button. That's when Asher realizes that they're in some sort of Starcraft. We can't call it that. Blizzard will sue us. Yeah, I just (laughs) just gotta keep working it in because I felt really clever and amusing. (laughs) So I just wanted to bring it back around. Like, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Starcraft. What, what are you going to do? Hands are tied. <laughs> Brixby turned on the button, the skulks pieced out, and then we got back to shore and some creepy teenagers showed up, possibly to sell us drugs. Who knows? Uh, you'll have to listen to episode 16 to figure out what they wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Who can say? Just kick in a can or a ball. It's been up for some discussion. So anything uh, else from that group of episodes that you two can think of that you think was noteworthy or that you want to talk about a little? I think that we nailed it. If we need to touch back on something, we can, you know, technically use later episodes. But yeah, <laughs> feels that's 25 minutes of talking so far or yeah, 24. The only thing I will say that I didn't I didn't say already was I'm going to miss those skulks. I mean, not just because of the <laughs> rope for healing barter economy, but it was just, I don't know, the the interactions with Seth were really fun. Yeah, for a uh, <laughs> group of people that I believe, when we rolled to check, were chaotic evil. They were uh, rather, yeah, yeah, they were nice. Pretty chill. Very accommodating. Yeah, I think if Connor hadn't gone through and killed their leader and decimated their numbers, they probably would have been a little more aggressive. Mm-hmm. But So that wasn't our favor. Thanks, Connor. Yeah. I for- I should thank him <laughs> next time I see him. Just next time, we'll drop in. I'm sort of hoping the Skulls come back or we go to them because we have a whole piece of rope. Was there a rope? There's a rope, right? They left the rope. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
It's tied to right. a rock. Because uh, every time we go back to that map, I see it and think there's some kind of horrible tentacle monster coming out of the skull hole. Yeah, so episode 30, back down the skull hole. We'll come up with a different name. <laughs> Here we go. We got the title already. We'll just pivot <laughs> to a Darklands adventure. Right, so uh, we will... Uh, break here for a message from our sponsor a mr radley and we'll see everybody back in the q a in a bit all of us will die someday and when that day comes we will take our places in the great queue in verasmus boneyard awaiting final judgment from the lady of graves this fate can sometimes be delayed but it can never be avoided entirely all of us will die. That's why I say to enjoy life in this plane while you can. Come on down to Mylan Rothley's obsessively morbid battle drone arena in the basement of the Chapel of the Wanderer this Star Day night. We've got dead bodies, we've got junked robots, we've got dead bodies tacked onto junked robots, creating something greater than the sum of their parts. They fight each other for your entertainment and I guarantee the bones will land in a spiral for your money back. Duskwalkers drink free, and the first star day of every month is Shovel Night. That's Milan Radley's obsessively morbid battle drones, where your dreams may not come true, but who cares? Explosions! Okay, and we are back. Thank you, Mr. Radley, for whatever that was. And... Uh, we are now going to have some questions from our scrappers, which if you're listening to this and you have any questions, we have a Discord, the link of which is available in the description of every episode of the show. And we have a channel on that Discord in which you can ask us questions that we will answer here on Machine Learning. So we have a couple of those for this episode. The first one of which is from Caden Lee, which is, what has been your favorite moment on the show to date, and what are you most looking forward to in the near future? And I guess since I'm reading it, I'll answer this one first. My favorite moment, honestly, so far has been the... It's a couple of moments. It's been the interactions at the Skulks. I have loved that. The whole thing has just been so funny, even though Vargas only took part in, like, one of the three that we had with them. It's just hilarious, and I just love the idea of us just hanging out with these horrible Darklands monsters. And I think what I'm most looking forward to in the future is us getting into more of like an actual fight with the Technic League, which I'm assuming is going to happen since there is specifically anti-Technic League campaign traits, because uh, that factor is a lot into the backstory I made for my character, so I'm kind of excited to be getting into that once we do. Izzy, how about you? Favorite character moment? There, like you said, have been a whole bunch. I still can't get over that moment in episode, what, two? when um, we were fighting the pink frog thing and Vargas went down and then got back up and killed it. <laughs> Excellent way to come into a new season or any season, our first season premiering. That was great. I thought the whole casino episode was real fun. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the more recent moments was like a super tiny thing, Jeff, that you did after we finally finished the fight with the robots. And Asher said something to Kira that I don't even remember, but it was like the sweetest thing. I was like, Aw, it's like they're little friends now. <laughs> it was it was a uh, uh, apparently less gripping moment than hey, sometimes people die, but I still remember it and just can't remember what he said. So that's something like a I know you could do it sort of thing. Yeah, that's adorable. It's like oh, they're like little buddies. And they can all not die, <laughs> and or be supportive by reminding people of other. <laughs> <laughs> times of death it's a whole it's a scale with them I mean, yeah no i think those are top three top three there oh jeff it's your turn go ahead jeff oh but what are you most looking forward to you forgot the second half of the question forward that's right i forgot the second half of the question i got so excited for the first half most looking forward to um eventually my teeny tiny orc blood rager will get to use some casting and i don't know what she's gonna do but i can't wait i mean i have an idea of what she's gonna do but we'll see what happens. 
Okay, now, Jeff. Oh, okay, now. <laughs> so, yeah, it's hard to pick favorite moments. I also enjoyed the Skulks, for sure. Uh, Vargas coming back was a great call. That trait, the fact that it's paid off so many times already. <laughs> I mean, mixed mixed feelings about that, right? <laughs> but, uh... Yeah, I was gonna say, I was not expecting to use it that much. <laughs> Episode but, uh, two. that's been fun. Yeah, yeah I really... Favorite moment today has to have been the dragging the robot through town. <laughs> Everything about it was, was just the the, it's just uh, absurd, and it was lovely. As far as what I'm most looking forward to in the near future, I sure hope it's in the near future, but lighting that torch. That's a good yeah, one. I would sure, also like to do that. Sure hope we get to do that. A bit of a bummer if we discover. It's going to be a real kick in the teeth if we just never can relight the torch. Like yeah. we just find out it broke forever. <laughs> Yeah, oh. <laughs> it's actually just out. Sorry. Fresh out of fuel. That's how torches work, right? It's the stuff that keeps away mosquitoes. Oh, no. You see, the thing is, we got to replace the battery, but it's like a weird watch battery, and only the endorphins sell it, and we can't get there. <laughs> you have to buy one on Fantasy Amazon. Oh, so I didn't say endorphins yep. instead of androphins. <laughs> oh. <laughs> is that what I was like? I assumed it was just a thing I didn't know. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Okay, uh, question two. This one is from j Rock. What is your favorite character that you've built but never got to play? Jeff, what is your favorite character that you built but never got to play? So the fa- my favorite one, and it was, <laughs> it was down to a, a choice between Michael J., the evocation sensation. He's a wizard played by Tom Lank <laughs> from, like, Buffy era. Tom Lank, season six, season seven. Uh, nice. Just a... Uh, super into himself wizard but i think what won out more more so because i really like to play this prestige class was i'd built a rougarou spiritualist named karaskir played by a basically like a current age seth green and rougarou is a race i've never played they're wolf-headed humanoids that can turn into wolves but are not mm-hmm. werewolves and actually hate werewolves <laughs> So it's just an interesting sort of like, I am a wolf person race that would be fun to explore. But but he was going to be a a soul warden spiritualist and eventually going into the mortal usher prestige class. So just this cool kind of guy who is wanting to help usher people (laughs) to the boneyard uh, and ward off (laughs) the undead and find... There's a bunch of interaction with psychopomps and getting powers from psychopomps, and it just seemed like a really flavorful. As far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, at, at me on, on Discord or Twitter, uh, listeners, but I think it's the last prestige class that was added because it was in the. They added it in the Tyrant's Grasp Adventure Path. So it just was a very cool idea that I hope to get to play sometime. Uh, Izzy, how about you? Is there a character you created that didn't get to play that you wish you did? Kind of. As as has come up before, fairly new to this whole tabletop version of this, but I did play a lot of play-by-post when I was a kid. And the convenient part about that, for me at least, was if, if like a game fell through, then I could just keep writing, take that character and be like, all right, well, I'm just going to go do a short story, which is what I did most of my very youthful childhood because, again... I didn't know anyone else who played games, so it was just a lot of figuring it out by myself. So it feels like no, because if I, if you, I guess playing is a different question. Mm-hmm. So the answer to that question would be like, sure, <laughs> sure. Yeah, like was there someone then in that case, like one that you went on to create your own little single player story for that you wish you had been able to use more in an actual play by post? I had an archer that was uh, like a former, I don't know, concubine or something, um, who like just, I basically made when I was like a kid, just did a Robin Hood reverse sort of thing. And that was fun. I am really, I love a ranged character. I love a melee character, but I love a ranged character too. And so that I'm working on a Pathfinder variation for that. So I haven't played that person yet and haven't gotten to play them yet. And that's about as much as I know. So when next time I reinvigorate a character and it's a, archer or a ranged character you will know that's that person there you go (laughs) all you 
Uh, mine is actually a fairly recent one because it was the first time I was going to do this in Pathfinder, but it was a Gestalt or Gestalt or however the G is pronounced in that class, which for people that don't know, that's basically when you multi-class, but you take everything from both classes at once. So you don't do like one level of one, one level of another. Your level one character has all the stats and abilities of the level one of both of those classes. So that you basically, it's basically like a power fantasy character. And it was a, going to be a witch mixed with a, what the heck are they called? Not shadow blade. Uh, the gloom blade? Gloom blade, yes. Blue Blade. And he was going to be based off of uh, Jaiman Han Su, who is uh, an actor. He was in, uh, he's been in a lot of comic book movies. And I got to do a single session as him where we didn't have any combat because it was like the introductory session where we all met each other and started our adventure. And then the guy running the game unfortunately ended up losing his job when COVID hit. And we had to stop it. And I just am so bummed out because I had like all this backstory and stuff for this character that was going to be good. And just playing such a ridiculously powerful <laughs> mixed class character like this. Because those two classes uh, work together really well. Like they don't sound like they might at first, but when you get all of the powers of both of them at once and you don't have to pick and choose, it's ridiculous. <laughs> The last question we have is from Commodore, and it is, what is your favorite TTRPG system? Though technically the original question was, uh, what is your favorite TTRPG system and why is it Pathfinder? <laughs> but going to uh, just kind of go with the first half of that question. And let's uh, start with Izzy on this one. Well, obviously it's Pathfinder because of all of the reasons of how it's the best. But hypothetically, if it wasn't, it would be probably powered by the apocalypse because I have a lot of younger cousins. And it's such a straightforward thing to teach to them because it's, you know, you, you roll 2d6 and everyone knows what a d6 is, even if you don't know what other d numbers there yeah. are. Even if you don't know it's called a d6, you know what it is. Right, <laughs> you know, you've seen that. It's a cube with dots. And it just makes it very easy to like teach to younger kids or newer people and then I think it allows uh, for anyone who prefers or like really enjoys the storytelling aspect you can pretty much do whatever um, which I think is obvious it's true with you know uh, crunchier systems like Pathfinder which is my favorite as specified by the question but I think it allows you to kick off a little faster you so you could do something like a one shot with people who've never played before although Jeff throwing the question to you you just did that like led and I'm, I guess lots of people have led others through a one shot of Pathfinder you've never played before which seems super scary it I, I guess I'm speaking on their behalf but the players seem to enjoy themselves so they you know you got to power through the fear so the question Commodore's question you know it really is mine actually is Pathfinder first edition <laughs> uh so is mine. I like I said. I just said hypothetically. If it sure, wasn't, sure. I don't need the hypothetical because because it is. But that's fine. I mean, your, yours obviously is too. I get it. I'm on your team. At um, previously mentioned. Sure. I mean, it would be preposterous for me to assume otherwise. The reason why Pathfinder is my favorite system, first edition, and I'll continue to specify because second edition's fine. That's fine. I have warmed up to it more as it's begun to expand the options available. But while the options available in Pathfinder 1 can be overwhelming, especially to new players, I thoroughly enjoy the amount of possible combinations of race and character or archetypes. I mean, I made the comparison once to a different game system where the subclass is available to a ranger. There's like five or six and then you look at ranger archetypes for pathfinder and they were over 50 it's like yep that sounds about right uh so just the sheer volume of choices and feats and directions you could go make it just super fun i mean we could we could play a party of four rangers or four bards or four paladins or druids and, and have a viable party 
they could probably survive throughout a whole adventure path if we put our heads together and that's just crazy how many different ways you can take it enjoy that similarly i haven't actually played any powered by the apocalypse games i've only played apocalypse world once about two years ago i had the right place right time joyful honor of getting to play with a couple of the hideous laughter folks and the wheeler woe folks in this one shot that we recorded in a hotel room at PaizoCon, and <laughs> it was just a, a real blast. It was my first time playing it, uh, the only time I've played it so far, and I loved that you build your backstories sort of together, and that, like who, you kind of, there's a whole round of character creation that you do communally, and sort of say who would you trust the least or the most, and, and I really like the fact that everything's so intertwined, and like you were saying, Izzy, the, the 2d6 is simple, but it, whoever is run the MC or storyteller or whoever for your game just gets the the way to say either, you know, all right, roll plus weird, or yeah, it sounds like you're using this play from your playbook. I just, I think it is a delightfully s simple thing that you could take in so many different directions that I adored that game that I played and would love to play more of that in the future. What about you, Jero? Mine is honestly probably 5e as much as it tends to get looked at on by and that's a lot all the of time groups. we have uh, for everything today I folks. very much <laughs> you finish your answer i very much uh enjoyed 3.5 when i was younger and i like pathfinder because it does remind me so much of 3.5 but 5e was what got me back into tabletop gaming in the first place and while it's true that the actual like Wizards of the Coast stuff for 5e is just ridiculously bare bones. The system itself, due to being like a much simpler, easier to use system than some of the ones that are more crunchy, means the homebrew for it is ridiculous. Like some of the games I've done and some of the people that are in our Discord probably know, uh, not too many people that watch know, because I don't think I mentioned it too much in the show, but I am like a huge fan of anime and such. And I have done so many 5e campaigns that have been set in like anime worlds because you're able to homebrew classes from TV shows into 5e in like 10 minutes. The amount of stuff that you can make with it because of how simple the system is and how easy it is to customize and modify compared to other ones that may be crunchier like Pathfinder or that may be more specific and such. It's like it's sort of the same kind of thing like Izzy said about Powered by the Apocalypse in that it's easy to make something in because the rules are simple. And I like that and I just also like the gameplay that it's crunchier than just rolling a certain number of a single die like some of the apocalypse ones or some other games are uh like GURP systems and stuff like that but it's not so crunchy that it can sometimes turn into a slog which as much as i love pathfinder and i love the official stuff for pathfinder it's very well written it's very fun to play when you end up with some stuff like a robot fight, that can get that in some of the higher level combats where a single combat between like four level 15 PCs and a single enemy can take three hours. It gets a little crazy. I like that uh, 5e, even when you're like a level 19, 20 character, you're still weak enough as a way to put it that like you don't have a super lot of stuff to do it is there isn't a lot of crunch to it and i like that about it yeah i was obviously goofing although there are pathfinder players yeah. who aren't <laughs> uh i've only yeah. played in a few one shots of 5e but i enjoyed every one that i played there's a lot of people that think they're like competitors and i guess they technically sort of are but what we need to really all come together and remember is that two discrete groups of people both came together in their own way to say, Dear God, 4th edition was terrible, let's make something better. <laughs> and that's what brings us all together, the Pathfinder players and the 5e players. That is our uh, neutral ground. <laughs> and that's what matters. 
We share mm-hmm. a common bond. I will say too, I'll circle back <laughs> for bonus. I played in the Summit of Kings one shot for Swords Fall, which is a super awesome world and game system. Highly recommend it. I played a rap battle with dice. Sounds amazing. And it just was phenomenal. And even if I hadn't won, I would have still had an amazing time just because it was super cool. Right. Well, that brings us to the end of our questions. So hope everyone has enjoyed this episode of Machine Learning, a pod about the machine from Pod Against the Machine, the only podcast with a supplementary podcast with a 25 word title. I am your host for this week, Jero, and I'm going to steal Sam's line. That was the actual thing. I'm not actually going to say going to bed. <laughs> it's like the anticipation's killing me. Okay, fine. I'll actually say the <laughs> actual like, line. You, you, didn't say the, you didn't say the line. You didn't say the line. I'm going to bed. <laughs> Good night, Hi, Drow. Drow. Theme song. Machine learning. Kill command machine. Terminate. Terminate. Terminate.